the growth of Britain's Muslim population will be a benefit Re-canceled. for Britain's society. <laughs> the growth. <laughs> Reed, we're gonna have to edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, where are we today? We're in Hampstead Heath, I believe. Yeah. So t- tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a, I was a comedy writer until I kind of got involved in uh, uh, the discussion around women's rights, and now I, uh, I'm a journalist and an activist. And you're most known for what TV show? Uh, Father Ted over here. In the U.S., it might be more black books and uh, the IT crowd, cool. but uh, yeah, Ted is the big one cool. here. And you, sir, are very well known on this island. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> uh, I'm Leo, Leo Curse, so uh, I'm a comedian, stand-up comedian, uh, slightly cancelled, not to the extent of Graham, but yeah, I got cancelled a bit for actually for for the allegations of transphobia. Yeah. Can you okay. believe that? Yeah. Uh, so I got I got my my show was cancelled from the Perth Fringe in Australia. And stuff, but uh, now I sort of do TV presenting, YouTubing, and stuff like that. And you have a show coming out, right? Yeah, yeah, on GB <clears throat> News. So yeah, hopefully next weekend. Hopefully by the time like people see this, it'll be you'll be able to tune in and watch my show. It's called the Saturday Night Showdown on GB News, 7 p.m. till 9 p.m. Cool, cool. And you guys are both extremely tall. How tall are you? And like, how tall are you? I don't know, cause I've got kyphosis, so I'm shrinking. <laughs> I used to be six six. <laughs> You're, how tall are you? 6'3". Holy shit. Six, three. That's pretty... Oh, I have one. It is... If they start copulating, Reed, make sure they're in the film. Yeah, yeah. We'll blame it on dog parks. Yeah, on Someone bike. hasn't read the paper, that wonderful paper. <laughs> um, okay. It is better to be tall than short. Move. Well, obviously. Yeah, well... Uh, so here. I don't think I'll be cancelled for this. Why do you strongly agree to that? Because it's better to be tall than short. Look at all the dating profiles. Women are like, he's got to be six foot six, have a ten inch dick and make like a billion pounds a year. <laughs> so I've got one of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Um, why Why do you agree it's better to be tall than short? Well, for all the all the reasons Leo said, and uh, I guess the only reason I don't strongly agree is it kind of brings with it its own problems, especially when you don't want to be noticed, don't mm. want to be, you know, a target. It can sometimes, you can sometimes stand out in places you don't want to. What about flying on a plane? Yeah, no, that, 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 that they, 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 <laughs> the roofs seem high enough for me. I've never had a problem. Mm. It does no, it does my nut. I did a tour of Southeast Asia, and over there, like the budget legroom is even shorter than it yeah, is yeah, yeah. in Europe. And like also, like you see these videos of like fat girls getting on planes, and they're like, "Oh, I've got to." They should provide bigger seats and stuff. And it's like, man, you can fit in that seat by just not eating as much cake. <laughs> I can't like shrink myself by not eating cake. Oh, okay. Here's another claim: overweight women who take up more than one seat should have to pay for two seats on a plane. Move. Standing right here. In fact, they should have to pay for three. I'm uncomfortable with this line of questioning. You're uncomfortable with the line of questioning. Yeah. Oh, you strongly disagree. Okay, pick up your pick up the uh, pick up this here. Write your best reason for believing that. Okay, don't show them. Don't show them. Yeah. What do you think? His best reason for believing that claim is? He's scared of getting cancelled by fat chicks next. Is that correct? No. It is not correct. I've written okay, hold on. Don't tell, okay. don't, don't tell us. Is the reason he gave you better than the one you have here? Very possibly. Very possibly. Okay. Yeah. Guess his reason. What is his reason for believing that? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, what, why would a smart person believe that an overweight person should pay for more than one seat. If well, I guess because Leo's uh, Leo's definitely, I would say, more conservative than me. He believes in personal responsibility and things like that. And I would say that he probably feels that it's the person's responsible 
to persons should be responsible to society to uh, take care of themselves so that they don't bring up questions like this. Am I am I close? Is yeah. that is, is that don't show us don't show us is that correct? Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. I mean, you're uh, you're so already. Well, it's, it's their choice. The burden shouldn't fall on other people. Other people shouldn't. You got like so you're gonna have low-income people who can't afford to fly on holiday because they've got to subsidise some fat lass who could just who's actually or guy or or guy, but the guys never seem to complain. Mm. But like, what, they're spending all this extra money on food. They, it's easier. It's easier and cheaper to to lose weight. And also, you're already cheating science by flying into the sky by being hoisted forty thousand feet into the sky. Why would you like laugh in the face of God even further by being a fat shit while you're doing it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what do you think of his reason? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it kind of uh, it makes sense on a on a. Um on what? Every level. Yeah. Except, I don't know, it just, uh, w would I say what I've written? Well, well, one more thing. Take one more guess at what his best reason is. Well, I think, because Graham's a sort of, like, uh, traditional socialist, so he thinks that, you know, everyone should contribute according to their means and people should support each other, even though that creates a, a dependency culture that people exploit. Is, is what he said correct for what your reason is? Might be. I don't know. It's, it depends on how you read it. Is it a better reason than the one you have on the board? I'm not sure if it's better. It probably points to the difference between right and left in some ways. Uh, more of an emotional response versus, uh, you know, probably uh, the response of someone who should be running things. Uh. <laughs> All right, show them your reason. It seems rude. All right, here's another claim. Ready? Also, can I just say another thing? You can say anything you want. This is a this this is a free island. Your the question is also a very very uh, American question. We don't really, Leo. You'd agree with me on this, wouldn't you? We don't really face these gigantic people. Who uh, um, it seems to be a question of the portions in the states. Yeah. I've often gone to the states and, and ordered food and. It's like they they come with enough for three people. Wait until you see what we're going to eat tonight. You coming to dinner tonight? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm, I have a friend who's going through a bit of a crisis. I'll tell oh, you in a second. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Personal responsibility is a more important value than politeness. Move. Personal responsibility is, Personal responsibility is a more important value than politeness. Move. Why do you strongly agree? Because personal responsibility is one of the most important values. Politeness is, uh, can, can hide a lot of evil. So if you look at uh, wokeism, uh, people say, oh, it's just, we're just being kind, we're just being polite. This whole, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of um, different genders and pronouns and stuff, that's, 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 a, that's a system of politeness. It's like, you know, some sort of Japanese hierarchy of addressing someone. Uh, but that, that politeness is just used as a, new cl as a new class system to exclude people. So politeness can, hold, can hide a lot of, uh, a lot of of evil personal responsibility is is the route to, to all the all the success in the world huh do you agree with what he said yeah I think it's a good argument I guess my problem with the question is I'm not exactly sure that these two things are oppositional or even connected politeness and personal responsibility I think one can be polite and uh, responsible for oneself I just always feel like politeness is a kind of a uh, contract we have with other people that we won't just behave like you know animals to each other personal responsibility is more important than freedom of speech move uh, keep it yeah thing. oh you're gonna wow all the way to disagree yeah, wow yeah. why well freedom of speech is incredibly important and uh, yeah I mean freedom of speech is incredibly important w why is it more important than politeness? Uh, personal responsibility. Uh, personal responsibility, sorry. Man, like, I think personal responsibility is, a, is well, it's in, the, in the phrase it's personal. It's, it's something that you, you sort of govern within yourself, uh, whereas freedom of speech is how you can uh, critique society and critique other people and, and change things for the, for the better uh, instead of living under some sort of, you know, totalitarianism. Why are you on neutral? Again, I just don't really see them as being oppositional or, or, or having a... I don't, I don't see how that question arises naturally in the world. Like, it seems to me like personal responsibility is a, 
is, uh, you know, it's a very uh, personal thing, whereas freedom of speech is a generalized thing that affects everyone. I guess, I guess by that token, uh, you said personal responsibility is more important than freedom of speech. Yeah. By that token, I would go, or actually, I would go on to slightly disagree or even disagree. Because okay. uh, I do think freedom of speech is more important. Yeah. Like, for, personal responsibility is a personal, I don't, it doesn't, doesn't connect for me as an as a as a, as, a, as, a, as two values that are in opposition to each other in any way. Yeah, I don't th I don't think they are. They're they're not in opposition to each other. Yeah. But um, if I had to give a sort of a weight, like a value to to one of them, yeah, like freedom, freedom of speech. speech. Yeah. Politeness is more important than kindness. Politeness is more important than kindness. Wow, you both strongly disagree. Why? Well, because kindness is <laughs> is kindness. Uh, politeness is whatever you want, whatever sort of sy system you want to construct, whatever sort of uh, you know formulaic, uh, codified system of addressing each other you want to construct. Like Victorian times, you know, you had to uh, had to speak to men differently to, to women, uh, white people differently to, to black people. We've we've seen this. This is this is the sort of uh, this is the societal structure. Um, Whereas kindness is just being kind. Uh, Graham, um, how confident are you that strongly disagree is the right line? <laughs> well, very, because like politeness, it seems... Okay, hold on, don't say anything. Go to the strongly agree then. <laughs> yeah, go to the... Go, mo to. Move over there, move over there. What would the best argument someone could... Here, stand on the stand on the mat there. there. Don't worry about getting them dirty. What is the best argument someone would make who is on this line? Tell him. I guess that uh, politeness is a form of kindness. Um, you know, or, or that they aren't actually two different things, that kindness is politeness. But that's why I was over there, because I don't think it is. I think kindness is real, and politeness is a kind of a mask sometimes that people wear. And sometimes the very worst people can wear that polite mask. Again, as, we were, as we've been saying, preferred pronouns is a very good example. I don't think it's kind to pretend to mentally disturb people that they're the opposite sex. I think that actually does them a lot of damage. Okay, using sex-based pronouns is kind. Move. Do you mean, so when you say sex-based pronouns, like... Oh, sorry, wait. Is that reality the ones... Reality-based pronouns. Reality... Based reality oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so like only referring to males as he uh, is kind. Uh, huh, why do you disagree? Because, uh, I mean, there's some people that put a lot, lot of effort into the transition uh, and live as, you know, like Blair White, for example, they're, they're convincing. I think that's, that's different to somebody like, I don't know, Eddie Izzard or, or Sam Smith, who's obviously just doing it to make people have to do some sort of like mental Rubik's Cube in their head before they address them. Uh, <laughs> they them <laughs> but like Blair White like there's no way I'm going to go up to Blair White and be like oh yeah how's it going sir you know yeah. what I mean that's ridiculous no Blair White's put the effort in yeah it's hot yeah yeah thoughts well uh, I'm not on strongly agree I'm on agree because um, I do think there's uh, I do think context is important here like for instance I have a few trans friends who identify as women uh, but they're male, and I use he, I use male pronouns for them because at this current moment, I feel like there's a war on all our sanity to try and uh, force us to uh, deny, uh, you know, the the truth that we can sense, you know, through all our senses. Uh, you know, men have different physiology, they sound different, they behave differently, their bodies are shaped differently. So for me to use, suddenly use female pronouns for a group of men, a self-selecting group, uh, often, you know, very few end up looking like Blair White, a lot are just put on some lipstick and hope that's enough. Um, I just feel at that at this precise moment, I think that it is actually less kind, not just to those people, to kind of engage them in in a in a a, a kind of bit of theatre for their benefit, 
but also for the many, many women who, who suffer the results of of the kind of mass delusion that the world has fallen under. Yeah. And I'm thinking specifically at the moment of, you know, Adam Graham, double rapist, yeah. nearly led into a women, women's prison. I connect that very strongly with someone like Eddie Izzard demanding to be called a woman. If you, if you think it's true of one, then it has to be true of the other. And unfortunately, I think that also extends to Blair White and my friends, uh, my trans friends, because, um, you know, it's the wedge that's used to uh, to uh, crack open uh, a lot of places that shouldn't be open to men. So then if you, if you uh, met Blair White and you didn't know that Blair White was trans, you'd assume that's a, that's a woman and you'd use you'd use female pronouns. I trust the BBC's reporting. Move. <laughs> I'm going to fire some rapid claims at you guys about the BBC. I was surprised Leo's over there. Yeah. I was actually surprised by that too. Why, yeah, why are you on that merely disagree? <laughs> I just don't want to look that biased. Uh, no, I think the, the BBC, certainly in the past, have been uh, somewhat trustworthy. I used to listen to World Service all the time when I was driving to, to yeah. gigs. But, um, man, like the last... The last, uh, the last few years, especially since they set up BBC Verify, and the last, oh, yeah. the last year running BBC Verify, like lied in her CV, and then she uh, told lies about uh, about Carl Benjamin, and uh, and yeah, and recently the reporting on the the conflict in Gaza is just ludicrous. They're yeah. just repurposing Hamas propaganda with the the Hollywood actor who's, who's played uh, you know various various roles. Just like it wouldn't take. It's not like it takes a lot lot of work to sort of uh, to sort of research this and find out that it's actually fake news and this guy's just an actor so how come you're and I agree with the Carl Benjamin stuff he's a friend of mine how come you don't strongly disagree then uh, because uh, the BBC still I mean you, and compared to other um, other outlets in the in the ecosystem it's still I mean it's still better journalism than than 16 year old girls on TikTok for example okay the BBC leans left. Move. You're both on strong news. Okay. In the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the BBC is biased toward the Palestinians. Move. Why do you strongly agree? Because the reporting is strongly biased towards Palestinians. In fact, Philip, my, my own cousin is a BBC journalist, and uh, she described uh, Israel as, as happy to kill civilians. And you know, sorry, Anjana, but that's like that's that's a shocking thing to say. Yeah. Well, why do you slightly agree? Well, I can see a little. You know, I think you have to allow for fog of war and the fact that like. Uh, all the rep uh, every report coming out of a war torn area is uh, is suspicious, but I do think that um, I do think that the kind of woke revolution that's taken place within the BBC that first kind of expressed itself in its attitude towards gender matters uh, is kind of uh, more widely representative of a view of the world that divides people into good and evil, uh, uh, oppressor and oppressed. Ah colonizer and colonized okay and i think the bbc is, is has even if they don't quite realize it themselves has fallen for that if the here's a new claim if the bbc offered me two hundred thousand pounds a year to be a reporter but i would have to tow the woke party line <laughs> i for one year i would take the job move One year. For one year. For one year. You both strongly disagree. Why? Boy, if I if I gave in now, fucking hell, what would <laughs> what would what would have been the point? You know, I've been I've been thoroughly cancelled by everyone. Um, you know, the idea of selling out at this particular point is is absurd to me. Okay, if the BBC offered me a job for one million pounds a year, but I would have to tow the woke party line, I would take it. One million pounds a year. 
that's like a hundred and that's like a million two hundred thousand dollars something like that would i be able to be paid through some sort of gary lineker type <laughs> system where i wouldn't pay any tax because that would make a big difference so what if it were two million pounds would you do it no tax two, two million pounds no tax would you do it yeah obviously <laughs> would you do it two million pounds one year no, no, because you're, you're, you can't deliver on this promise, Peter. I'm not going to receive any money from you if I say yes. <laughs> Leo's just div 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 has just thrown all his beliefs in the bin, <laughs> revealed himself to be. You don't, you don't have to. You don't have to believe what you're saying. Like, I, I know people who work for the BBC. None of them believe it. They just have to. And I know people who like and actors and stuff. You know, if you're an actor, if you work in comedy or or music or anything like that, you've got to. You got to toe certain lines. You got to like, you know, say what you say. I know people in America who post on Instagram. Oh yeah, go go Biden. I'm voting for Biden. I'm voting for Hillary. And they're like, man, I vote I vote for Trump. You know what I mean? So like, and also, if I was getting two million pounds tax free for a year to work for the BBC, like that, that I'd get an Edinburgh show out of that. I'd be able to I'd be able to do uh, videos after that, mocking like picking apart everything I said. I think it'd be a great opportunity to to uh, to actually sort of expose things. I'll tell you another reason why it's a bad idea. Tell you why. Because this stuff is coming to an end. I think that, like, uh, there's basically, I think you'll find that uh, apparently Disney World is now uh, free of lines because uh, everyone's so sick of the woke messaging. And I think that what's going to happen soon is that TV executives, uh, the BBC included, are going to realize that you know they're not they're not reflecting the world they're not reflecting public opinion ah. they're simply reflecting a kind of narrow elitist view of uh, existence and okay i think those days are coming to an end here's the next claim comedy is a better way to spread truth than journalism comedy is a better way to spread spread truth than journalism uh. why neutral um, because I, oh, I'm sorry, because, sorry. Because I don't think it's necessarily better. I think that the best journalism is like, you know, unbelievable. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you're thinking about the journalists who went in, you know, to Dachau and places like that, and you know, the 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 coverage of uh, of of various natural disasters that we've had. Certainly, journalism has let us down many times. I think. Comedy is a good way to inject a bit, a, 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 a bit of truth into things, but it's not certainly not what comedy is for. Yeah, and as a as a comedian, I mean, there's a, there's limited. I mean, I guess it depends what sort of, what sphere of comedy you're working in. But as a stand up comedian, man, you just don't have the the time and the space and the attention span of an audience to sort of get into the same level of detail as a as a journalist can. New claim. If I could choose only one, I would rather be 10% smarter than 10% funnier. <laughs> if I could choose only one. If I could choose only one, I'd be 10% funnier rather than 10% smarter. Now you'd have to go to the other one to be consistent, right? Yeah. So yeah, I'm doing that. Yeah. Okay, so you didn't go to the other one just to make sure that this is like a consistency check. Men are more funny than women. <laughs> really? I I'm very why why? Uh, because. Uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I've spent a lot of time as a comedian and uh, this is just, I mean, it's just a generalization, you know what yeah. I mean? You can't, you can't blame it, but I've just noticed, I don't know what, like, men are wired different, I don't know, maybe there are biological differences between men and women, I don't know why it is, obviously some women are funnier than some men, but overall, I think men are funnier than women. Uh, I don't think that it is necessarily a question of funniness as to why certain people why for instance just fewer female stand-ups than there are male stand-ups sometimes it's a question of confidence uh women don't really meet men in the same way men get into comedy to meet women the same way they get into bands to meet women uh so there's a kind of a 
selection process that involves a great number of things that also include being funny. And sometimes, you know, the funniest people are the, are the people who don't speak all the time, who, who just say one uh, smart thing uh, when it occurs to them. Yeah. And I've, found, I've known many women like that. Do you have kids? Yeah. I would rather be 10% funnier than a 10% better father. Oh, so you'd both rather be a better father? Yeah. Yeah. I would rather be... I would rather be a 10% better father than 10% smarter. Still here. I would rather be a 10% better father than have 1 million pounds. Should we be on a for this? I don't know. Where should you be? Sorry, what's the question again? I would rather be a 10% better father than have 1 million pounds. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, uh... So that means you want to be no, a better father. No, I'm already, like... I'm finding the question. Look, here's my, here's my thing. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure where I am on this, but I will say this. If I had a million pounds, I would be a 50% better father. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, being 10% doesn't feel like a good deal when you can, you know, buy your kids an apartment in Disneyland. <laughs> Any topic should be able to be joked about. Oh, yeah. So, so you strongly, so you think any topic should be able to be joked about? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I've seen any topic being joked about, you know, it's like, if you approach it in the right way, you can totally do it. You, you, what's the right way? What's the wrong way? Uh, the wrong way is when people just, and you see this on the open mic circuit a lot, like people get up there and say something outrageous. It's like the equivalent of, you know, a, a sort of uh, a tweet that you know, is de deliberately controversial to get sort of uh, attention and yeah that doesn't that doesn't work as a you know as a, as a punchline something shocking it'll maybe work once in a set but you can't you can't sustain you know you can't sustain a comedy set on that what what topics can't be joked about uh i wouldn't like to hear a joke about what happened on october 7th and maybe it's a question of time, time. time. you know and maybe it's a question of uh of, of whether there's victims who can still be hurt and whether they will be hurt. I mean, the, the re, I'm not and strongly agree, even though I, I do agree that almost everything can be joked about simply because of what Leo was saying, that there's, you know, there's people who don't um, understand how you use comedy and sometimes when they're uh, entering into a dark area they do so without any kind of concern for the craft or you know for people's tastes and it's just clumsy and unpleasant and it makes people think that comedians are a bunch of arseholes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well that's true maybe maybe that's that is a good thing i feel i have free speech in the uk i have free speech in the uk move You slightly agree. What what things don't you have free speech about? Well, it's more it's more the uh, the platforms I'm allowed. You know, I had to write a fucking book before people would speak to me about my about my great book, on, by the way. Oh, thank you very much about uh, my opinions on gender. Um, but also, I'm shadow banned on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, Still, yeah, all my tweets appear with ah. uh, with uh, what's the word uh, warning sensitive yeah, content. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I feel like we're all, wherever you are, on a leash. Ah, okay. You know? If I could surrender my passport to the UK, and in return, I would get a passport to the US, as a full citizen, including voting rights, I would do it. Uh, yeah. Hold that. <laughs> Ask me the question. You're going to slap me. <laughs> no. Ask me the question the other way around. Oh, okay. If you could come here, full voting rights, immediate citizenship to the UK, would you do it? Okay. <laughs> I should have rephrased it so that you would. Yeah, would well, you it. know, the grass is always greener, isn't it? I would do it. I would why, do it. Why is that? Here, take the mic. Would you rather live in the United States or the UK? Well, no, it's got to be one or the other, isn't it? 
I would rather live in the UK, no question. But, well, almost no question. But why, why is that? I mean, um, America's the land of the free. Because why would I rather live in the UK? Uh, because I think the United States is marching toward hospice. I think we have some extremely serious problems that I don't know how we're going to get, o- get, o- get over or overcome. Pretty bearish on debt. I'm pretty bearish on fentanyl addiction, homelessness, on civic responsibility and participation. I'm, I'm pretty bearish on polarization and other features of American society that I don't, I don't think have crept in here yet. And I just don't think that the, the economy is sustainable. I, mean, I, the, I think we're in for a very rude awakening. But I mean, over the past decades, the American economic output as a share of world GDP has stayed constant at 25%, despite having, I think, a tenth of the world yeah, population. Yeah, it stayed constant, but you know what hasn't stayed constant? The debt. Right, yeah. And this insane money printing that we've been doing as if there's no, there's just no accountability. That is yeah. simply unsustainable. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see what happens. Do you guys wanna, uh, do you, one of you guys wanna facilitate this? Well, get, get you into the UK? <laughs> no, I'd, I'm ready. Kind of I'm ready. Uh, do one of you guys wanna facilitate the game between the other two of us? What's that? Just do, to do what I was doing. All right. Um... Make claims. Make claims. We make claims. We move to lines. So you get off of the strongly agree. So, yeah. So like you move to the side. Yeah. All right. Cool. And then you stand in between us. Okay. Um, TikTok is digital fentanyl and should be uh, banned by Western governments. Wow. So you think? Because it's interesting. I mean, you're both free speech people, but um, I mean, why? Why, why do you think uh, TikTok should be banned? It's active Chinese disinformation that's attempting to um, divide, divide us and spread derangement syndrome. Yeah. And Graham, you? Yeah, I, I, I think that's true. It's uh, also the fact that everything is so short. I think it's, uh, it's doing two things. It's, it's, it's pouring in misinformation. And at the same time, it's, it's stopping us uh, being able to process uh, real information, yeah. you know. So I, f- I think I love TikTok. You know, I have it. I use it every day. Uh, at the moment, I'm being thrown up. Puppies being rescued, but I can also feel myself being manipulated, even by the puppies. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, why, why am I? doing this and not reading I don't know Eric Hoffer or something yeah you know what I mean because <laughs> that would be boring <laughs> um, TikTok is a Chinese soft weapon to destabilize the West there's no question in my mind that that's the case right. there's no question that that's true yeah and yeah it feels it feels it, well look uh, let's just take the latest example the bin laden thing. the bin laden thing right, yeah. all these people talking about what a great statement it was you know <laughs> it's like they fucking th- flew two planes into buildings and killed lots of innocent people and uh everyone's now going oh maybe he had a point you know it's it's not good and uh and i think that again it's not just the information it's the salami slices of information that mean that you can never really catch a hold on what's true and what's not true right, yeah. i find it i find it like it's it's not just uh it's not just um uh propaganda it's propaganda that's changing our internal right. the, the, the workings of our brain yeah you know china is behind the propagation of gender ideology in the west huh i don't know if they're behind it but they're certainly fueling it Right, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know if they're behind it, but they're certainly fueling it. And I, we know that for the multiple sources, we know the Confucian Institute is not behind gender ideology per se, but other things. We know that um, actually Faisal al Mutar told me this from Ideas Beyond Borders that there are outlets in the Middle East that go through China and Russia that are pumping in critical race theory, Black Lives Matter propaganda, gender ideology, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and related to that, uh, do you think the uh, attacks of October the 7th, the no Hamas... No questions, at- claims. What's that? Claims, Oh, no yeah, questions. of course. The Hamas attacks of October the 7th and the response in the West have opened people's eyes to how toxic wokeism is. 
Yes. Definitely. Um, not everyone. So you seem quite quite hesitant, Peter. Why why do you think uh, why why are you hesitant about that? I'm, like why do you think there there is but but not not much? I'm hesitant because it's by proxy. It's not the toxicity of wokeism. It's that institutions pump out, specifically educational institutions, pump out some awfully dangerous ideas, and that is just one of them. So it's not that they've been aw awakened to wokeism per se, but it's that they've been awakened, not even awakened, but they've, they've become more aware that, that all of these ideas are bundled within an ideology that is coming from university systems, which just, by the way, I've been screaming about this for over 10 years now. Nobody has listened. So here we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that's. I think so. I think a lot of people woke up on October 7th and the, the, the following days to quite how far the left has degraded itself. Uh, I think it's spent five years uh, not working on a solution to the, to the Israel-Gaza situation, but uh, uh, reporting women to their employers for uh, wrong think. And I think that this gradual demeaning of women uh, ended up in people looking at the bodies of raped and, and brutalized women and shrugging. Uh, and I think that the people who saw that happen, I think will, won't forget it. I certainly won't forget it, you know. Gender ideology is just a reinvention of the patriarchy. I is just a reinvention of the Patriarchy. Disagree? Why do you why do you disagree? Well, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna get into J James Lindsay type trouble now, but like I, I I I'm not sure I agree with the idea of the patriarchy as a real system that is in power and is oppressing. All right, but if you go back to Victorian times when uh, like for example women weren't allowed to have uh, bank accounts and stuff like that. Yeah, I guess maybe then the patriarchy was definitely in full effect, but I think that a um, hundred years of, uh, of uh, feminist uh, uh, fighting for space at the table and a, and a proper share, share of the pie actually did help and it did do something. I think probably one of the, one of the problems with the world is that it's not a pa patriarchy, it's an aristocracy and uh, it's men and women uh, in a certain kind of elite who are pushing some of the, uh, you know, dictates around gender ideology. Mm. So, yeah. Anti-woke people are becoming just like woke people. Neutral. Uh, why do you say? Why, why are you on well, the I'm fence? I'm presuming you answer ask the question for a reason, but <laughs> I can't really think of any uh, examples. I don't like anti woke comedy. Really, usually I find it a little bit too easy. I'm right here, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I just mean sometimes it's like Coles to Newcastle. You know what I mean? Because they make they they are so self evidently uh, parodies sometimes. Um, but like I think in general. Uh, anti-woke stuff is it couldn't go near the woke stuff because the woke stuff is so mad and, <laughs> and do you know what I mean and in such a kind of upside down world that I just can't imagine anyone ever equaling it <laughs> but Peter you've got a, a firmly held opinion on this I do have a firmly held opinion because I've seen this space deteriorate I've seen the same tactics of cancellation uh, they ba basically it's you can look at it a number of ways tactical belief uh, heresies uh, it's become largely Christian the space if not openly Christian nationalist and so woke people aren't Christian or Christian nationalist but it has a kind of religiosity toward it and an intolerance it, it's become uh, an a massive the anti-woke space is a massive echo chamber right now and I find oh. it deeply disturbing Oh, I might come over here because of that. Yeah, I guess you're talking about kind of uh, uh, the American 
uh, right how they've kind of reinvigorated themselves by attacking wokeism. Uh, and of course, that's going to bring in a, a lot of fellow travelers uh, who are just using it to ride the same old conservative hobby horses, uh, except even harder than they used to ride them. Yeah, uh, they, so they, that makes sense to me. They, they've become what they, they they're bec- anti woke people are becoming what they hate. Mm. And they're using a lot of the tools, tactics, and strategies. And they're using the same kind of delivery mechanism banning, defunding. I, I just find the whole thing incredibly disturbing at this point. I have noticed that I have noticed that happen with the Palestinian issue. I noticed there was a video channel that recently had to pack up because they they were supporting the Palestinians, you know. Um, so maybe that is happening a little bit. But I think that was an important lesson for them to learn that the sword that they've been so happy to swing around, you know, has two edges, you know. So maybe maybe things will balance out a little bit. Uh, the growth of Britain's Muslim population will be a benefit Re-canceled. for Britain's society. <laughs> the growth. The growth. The growth of it. Reid, we're going to have to edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> the growth. That's fine. It's just, you, you started talking about double-edged swords. And <laughs> yeah, well, you know. I, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think, uh, I certainly don't want to see more people shouting Alu Akbar on the street, you know. I found that really disturbing over the last um, four weeks. Um, but Graham, the, the Met Police explained that calls for jihad can have many meanings. Yeah, that's right, and all of them end up with dead Jews. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I don't uh, I don't really think that uh, growth is a good idea. I think that p- perhaps integration of the people who are already here is a better thing than growth. And by integration, uh, I mean, what, what do you what do you mean by integration? I mean, I mean to show that. Uh, our society frowns upon things like murdering and raping Jews and civilians and our society does not uh, support it and does not support people who support it. But some would say that would be erasing uh, part of uh, part of what the Quran represents and what it, it states. Well luckily that's not my that's not my problem you know all I can do is uh, is uh, proceed according to my morality which uh, I guess comes from a, a Christian morality, uh, a kind of do unto others as you would have them do unto you and, and principles like that and turning the other cheek and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. But you know, I certainly don't have the experience of uh, someone living in Gaza or someone living in Israel, so it's, it's hard for me to imprint my values on that society. However, I can, as part of this society, stand up for what I believe in, which is, you know, people shouldn't be going out on the street calling for jihad when it affects people on the other side of the world in a very real way. And Peter, you're much more empathic. But I do have a question for Graham. Every single thing you said seems, every everything you said seems to me you should be on the strongly disagree. Yeah, I, I just don't look gay by standing too close to you. <laughs> I just get re, okay. re, re cancelled. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, yeah, no, I do. I do. I am concerned about the things Graham said. I'm concerned about um, safety of Jewish people here. I'm concerned about the cohesion of the society. I'm concerned about the sovereignty of the nation. Uh, I mean, it's not even my country, mm. but I am. I am deeply concerned that there is a very serious problem that I don't think you'll be able to extinguish once once it uh and, and it's just all it is is a numbers game. It's just a numbers threshold. There's mm-hmm. nothing I think look, we're not ready to be honest about this and well, that's why we're probably going to edit this out. We're not ready to. <laughs> we're, we're just not ready to be honest. But we're not ready to have an honest conversation about it. And the last thing I need is some lunatic coming with a butter knife to saw off my head, right? So yeah, but also yeah. also the 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 way the conversation has been conducted about immigration means that 
even saying the word immigration is right. enough to get you get you cancelled. So it's a extremely. Uh, right. You're very brave in, in, in addressing it and using uh, using facts and figures to back up your your opinions. But you know, it's not my area of expertise. But I all I could do is stick to what I believe in in terms of my own personal morality. You know, we, we, here's what we know. We know in Western Europe, large numbers of Muslim immigrants mean Jews flee. Mm. Now, if you want to say we don't like Jews, it's a good thing that they flee, then let's be honest about it and have the government leaders say we don't like Jews, we hate Jews, maybe we don't want to gas them, but we're glad that they're fleeing. Mm. At least that's an honest response as opposed to denying it. Yeah. So I'm not saying that I'm not advocating a policy, but I am saying you should be honest about the consequences of your immigration policy, and yeah. I do not think we're being honest about it. Yeah, and certainly we, we mean the the yeah the West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and funnily enough, a lot of Gulf states uh, have already had that conversation, are much more open about it, and they've yeah. got more direct experience yeah. of it. But we're still trying to pretend that uh, you know diversity, is strength, etc. Um, okay, here's one. Uh, we are coming to the end times. Okay. Oh, all the way over. Okay, so neither of you think that any of these recent uh, kind of convulsions are a sign that we're heading down the toilet. I do, but I don't think it's the end times. Yeah. I, you know, Nick Bostrom said he thinks that the singularity is going to be here within a year, which blew my mind. Um, Can you explain what the singularity is for me? Yeah, it's just... Not the, for the viewers. Yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's just the point beyond from some kind of technological advancement the point beyond which you can't imagine what a society would be like so there are many singularities like agriculture the internet phones or many they change life in such the the way that it was hard to imagine beforehand so there's going to be a kind of singularity a kind of technological happening that's just going to be utterly unfathomable it's like the the uh, famous expression would be like an earthworm trying to understand a symphony like we just can't fathom it mm. so i think that that's going to be that's a, an x risk there are a lot of x risks you know existential risks but i don't i don't i'm i'm i disagree but i don't strongly disagree because i'm open to the possibility that there yeah. could be something horrific i think we're going to see the uh, end of democracy uh, to be honest, I just think where um, democracy has sort of become corrupted, and you know, if you look at the Labour government, for example, they decided that um, you know people weren't voting the right way, uh, and I'm sure they had like noble intentions. They wanted to create a you know more utopian society or whatever. But they, they Peter, Peter Mandelson admitted that uh, he opened the borders to to rub the right's nose in it and to bring in people who'd vote the right way, and that's anti-democratic. And I think uh, we're we're going to see. For for a long time, people thought that as China got richer and as these you know more totalitarian countries got got richer, they drift towards they naturally gravitate right. Right. towards uh, democracy because people you know once they've got their material needs taken care of, they want they want freedom. Actually, what people really want is safety. And if COVID and lockdown and everything showed us anything, it's that people would rather have the sort of illusion of safety than have the real uh, the actual genuine safety of being free. Um, okay, here's one. Uh, there is in every society uh, an elite who has control over everyone else. Oh, okay. So you disagree completely. Yeah. No, I mean, well, I've worked, I've worked in government, I've worked in policing and, and intelligence and stuff. And I just haven't met them. I think most of the people. There's this idea that there's this like shadowy network of like you know super rich people and super smart people who you know meet in, in bunkers or whatever underneath Denver Airport. And it's a nonsense. All the all the people uh, all the people that I met in, in government were mostly just kind of clueless and trying to trying to get along as as best they could. I think you know things become when things start moving like in trends so uh, i mean like the the demographic change in, in britain with mass immigration but also things like uh, the proportion of gdp in western countries that's spent by the state rises steadily incrementally every year and eventually that's that leads to communism okay okay peter you slightly agree 
I do. I think that there are individuals who exert radically disproportionate influence due to connections, due to f financial influence. Uh, and, I, and I think that they have leveraged certain elements of the society, certain institutions in the society to have a disproportionate influence. Uh, here's one that's slightly connected. Um, all of the Western world's current ills at the moment trickle down from the corruption in academia. <laughs> Are you both on agree or just slightly agree? I'm slightly. I'd maybe, I'd maybe go and agree if there was more space, but not. <laughs> well, let's hear the argument from the academic. Yeah, I, I'd be willing to go to slightly agree because you said all. Yeah. Certainly, I think most. So I, actually, I guess, I guess I am on slightly. Right. You know, I'll crowd, crowd you out. You're not allowed to uh, be between them. Yeah, I know, I know. That's the, that's the rule. That's the rule. Yeah, I, I, I think that, independent of any conclusion, the big ill that I see, that very few people, well, people are talking about it now more than they were before, but it's inherent distrust in institutions because of the corruption. Yeah, mm. that's the problem, as opposed to forwarding particular conclusions about trans or certain racial nonsense or systems or what have you and and I think that that is something that's going to be far more difficult for the West to sustain uh, than any conclusion they forward I think it's going to fall when it as it becomes commercially untenable and we can see this you like uh, Miss Marvel no what's it called the Marvels yeah, this yeah. film that's out and it's like the worst Marvel opening weekend ever and it's because they've like they've laid it on so it's like that South Park mm. thing of like you know make it labor you yeah. know what I mean they've, they've, they're doing that across you can see it across all the Disney stuff and um and that's like the most visible example of all this sort of ESG and EDI stuff, which co which springs has, has come from uh, academia. academia. Um, but that's that's happening through every organisation. Every organisation has HR departments that are pushing this stuff. And like, if you work in IT or whatever it is, you're getting sent on ridiculous, unconscious bias training and all this sort of nonsense. And all of this is like a drag on the efficient running of operations. So it's, right. it's having a cost right across all industries and across all you know public sector organisations. So that's, yeah, that's a huge, that's, but I think, I think the fact that it's becoming a cost, ESG is like a pyramid scheme. So everybody does the ESG stuff to get the funding. More funds flow in because everybody's doing the ESG thing, but now it's starting to break. And as soon as those funds, funds flow out, it's going to be, it's all going to collapse. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to come down. But a lot of our, a lot of our problems come from uh, things like demographic change. Uh, just the fact that um, people are, uh, you know, we, our society is sort of, um, Liberalism has, has had a sort of negative effect in that, like, you don't have the strong sort of culture and and families and, and stuff identity. like that around people. Yeah, an identity that, mm. you know, keeps people, you know, striving and, and being strong. Okay. I uh, I met a nurse the other day who told me that uh, she had training that told her there was more than two sexes. <laughs> uh, NHS training. There you go. Anyway, yeah. I think that's all I have, really. I mean, I, I got one. Yeah. I have one. I would rather be a good comedian than a good lover. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be neutral on that one. Yeah, I think I'm not be. a comedian. Right. Huh. Slightly. I'm only like. Uh, I'm only. It's. Uh, it's. I'm. I. Leo's the comedian. I'm just. I'm just. I just do five minutes every th two months. You know. Of love making. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be good. That would be really good. <laughs> uh, I would. I would rather be a good comedy writer than a good lover. Wow. Again, I, I think I'm good enough at all these things. You're good enough at all of them. I'm good enough at all of them. I just don't want to. I'm going to stay neutral because. Uh, I think uh, I think I, there's literally no room for improvement in the bedroom, and uh, <laughs> comedy-wise, I'm doing about as well as I have to. Wow. Okay, um, which is probably true in both cases. Okay, I think the whole point of like being a comedian or whatever we do is is to do the loving. So if, you know, if you if you take if you turn into a Ken doll or whatever, what's the what's the point in what's, what's the point in like getting that glory or whatever it yeah. was? Yeah. Um, all right, that's all I got. Reed, you got anything? Uh, no. Okay. Did you did you have fun? Yeah, it was great. Thanks. Yeah. Peter. Did you have fun? Yeah, I did. Yeah.
Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate you coming down and playing. That's good. All right, that's, that's a wrap. <laughs>